Help us, Obi-Wan. You're our only hope. Please help me convince J.J. Abrams to cast more women in Star Wars 7, the new movie coming out. May the 4th be with all of you, my Leo Geek friends. I'm here tonight to discuss all things Star Wars, but especially the movie and the recent casting announcement. Um, with me, as always, is my partner in geekdom, Josh Gilliland. We also have with us a special guest, uh, a judge and also a Star Wars expert, Judge Sherino, joining us from New York. Hey, Judge, how are you? How are you? I'm good. And now right. you, can actually, you can actually give the, the name of the Star Wars set. Oh, I'm, you knew it. You were the one who revealed it to me tonight. So you tell us, drum roll, what is Star Wars 7? The Order of the Jedi. Ooh. All right. Well, I'd love to start off, Josh, if you don't mind. I know Judge Sherino is really an expert in the Star Wars world and some of the books that have been written um, about kind of what happens after the return of the Jedi. So I know none of us know exactly what's going to happen in Star Wars 7, but I'm kind of looking to you based on the title, based on some of the casting news, based on the authors. What sort of things do you think we might expect in Star Wars 7? Well, technically, we now know absolutely nothing because the, <laughs> uh, the, the, the people who designed the canon have said that the, uh, but for the six movies, nothing else is canon. Uh, and all of the extended universe, they might use some, they might not use any. Uh, so all bets are off with regards to what the story will actually entail. But they're going to hold on to those first three prequels, huh? They're like, we're sticking with those. The six movies are, are the canon, and, uh, and, and, and that's all that they consider canon, with the exception they have actually said that the Clone Wars cartoon and the new uh, Rebels cartoon that's coming out also will be uh, considered part of the Star Wars canon. Wow, I love it. That's very lawyer-like. I think it is all of us as lawyers, we appreciate that, where they're like very clearly like, they're like, this is what is presidential. The other stuff may be persuasive, but is not binding on us when we write uh, the script for Star Wars 7. So as a legal geek, I appreciate those lines. No, I, I guess we're going to have to have alternative universes to explain <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the EU and all that went on there. So we'll see if, if Han and Leia get married, if they have uh, three children like they do in the books. Does Luke get married? None of that, none of that is now known. Wow. I'm, I'm okay with that because it's okay to be surprised in a movie. That's, that was the beauty of Star Wars the first time around, and a lot of us take that for granted now. The, the entire bookcase of books that I have is not happy about it. <laughs> Plus, you can also, and J.J. Abrams, who's at the center of Star Wars, sometimes you can overplay the secrecy. Remember with Star Trek, the last Star Trek, the, what, the birth of Khan, I don't know what the name of it was, but, oh, it was such a secret what it was, and, you know, this, the, the villain's identity was so secretive, and everyone's like, it's Khan, and he's like, no, 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 it's a secret, and then it was Khan. So sometimes almost the obsession with the secrecy ends up really backfiring. I mean, I agree, I don't like spoilers, but it's okay to have some ideas to speculate. I think, you know, J.J. Abrams' kind of obsession with secrecy to the other extreme uh, can actually kind of hurt his movies. And I'm still kind of hopeful that that's going to somewhat come into play and that at least some of the really good parts of the extended universe are going to be surprised by actually being there in the movie. But we'll, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. It, wait and see. We can have a surprise. It's a good thing. And in theory, this would have been 50 years after the end of the Clone Wars. So it's possible you can see somebody very elderly from the end of the Clone Wars appearing in this. So let's wait and find out. Well, so, okay. And again, I'm not the Star Wars expert that you guys are beyond. I really stick to the original three. So after the return of the Jedi, do we have any idea? I mean, we still have Han Solo, Princess Leia, Luke Skywalker showing up in some form in this new movie based on the cast announcement. Do we have any idea like when, how far after the return of the Jedi, this new movie is going to be set? Have they given any indication of that? I, I believe they, they, they did state the, the amount of years that, it, that it's following the, the movie. And it, it also appears that there will be no Lando. Or at least he wasn't at the, the cast uh, meeting. But yeah, we're, Which we're is looking... a big disappointment because I love Lando. Right. We're, we're looking at 25 years after the movie, I believe it was, that, the, uh, that this one would be taking place. So uh, it, it's almost real time in where the movie... Uh, is war so that people who have aged those amount of years basically in real life and in the movie. 
So we don't have to expect a lot of Botox or CGI to try and make, you know, Han Solo look uh, 20 years younger than he really is now. Han, Han uh, you know, Han looks the best of the three <laughs> stars, I, I, at least in he my does. opinion. That's I, not saying much, though. Even he hasn't aged that well. But Yeah, I, you know, Mark, Mark was in a pretty bad accident, a car accident, and... and 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 Carrie Fisher has has you know been very honest of all of her troubles and 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 abuses and you know that that does have some wear and tear on on the body. She has lived a rough life. I do have to give a plug for her bush uh, her book. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, Josh. I don't know where that came from. Her book, Wishful Drinking, is just a fantastic book. Um, and a real she is a brilliant writer and just hysterical. And she was also brilliant, of course, when she was on 30 Rock. But uh, yeah, I, it will be interesting to see what kind of role, how big a role the three of them, of course, have in this one. And, and Mark Havel, to his credit, I mean, he, he's he's been seriously working out with a trainer and uh, you know, tweeted out uh, some pictures the other day, and he's gotten himself in really, really good shape. So, wow. you know, they are taking it seriously. Well, watching some of the interviews with Hamill, I mean, he does have a profound respect and love. Of, big time. Yeah, um, big, and that, I mean, that is so nice to see, and a lot of sci-fi actors do. And, you know, you see those who are grumpy about it, but some of them truly, truly love it. And that's a beautiful thing. So he's he believes in this because I guess even, even even to the point of the people that are in the costumes that he has gotten back, who are real real fans of of, of the movie. So whether you're talking, you know, Anthony Daniels, uh, or Chewbacca, or mm -hmm. um, you know, Peter is is you know, they really love that character that they played for all of those years. And I'm glad to see that it's the same person in the costume as opposed to you know just CGIing uh, Chewbacca. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no CGI. They've got to dial back on the CGI. So, yeah, and I'm very excited to see Chewbacca and R2 and C3PO are going to be back. I mean, they should be, but that's, um, I think everybody loves them. So, no Jar Jar Binks, though, hopefully this time around, right? Unless the opening is the Gundam <laughs> homeworld getting taken a new hit. <laughs> if that's the beginning, all is forgiven. Just. <laughs> People gonna die. Boom! All gone. <laughs> that would be awesome. Everything would be forgiven. <laughs> Are we going to hear Darth Vader's voice? Is James Earl Jones going to be back? Because, I don't know, I, it's kind of like Dallas. You know, they rebooted Dallas, and I was a huge Dallas fan back in the 80s, and they rebooted Dallas, and actually it was still awesome. J.R. was better as an old guy screwing over his own son than he was when he was a young guy screwing over his own, like, brother and his own wife. And so, um, you know, I loved it, but once he died, I was like, there's really no point to Dallas without that big bad. I really can't imagine a Star Wars without Darth Vader. And yeah, Dallas has always been the JR show. I mean, right. it, 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 you know, everyone else is just window dressing to, to JR. Um, you know, the, the, the reality of Star Wars is it's more about C3PO and R2D2 than it is about any other character. They're the only ones that are in all of uh, the movies from beginning to end. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it, it's, I, I cannot see how they can really put. Darth Vader into this movie, maybe a flashback or two. Um, I'm hoping like for an Obi Wan voiceover. Yeah, you yeah, know, Obi Wan was always you know, talking to Luke. Maybe something along, but I'm sure that there's going to be a a evil villain or a Sith of of a of dramatic enough persona to uh, you know whet our appetite for uh, that kind of character. So I, we might see the next greatest Vader uh, if we don't see Vader. Hmm. Yeah, and it's I'm I want a new villain. I want a new villain. Go big, come up with something original and wow everyone cuz we'll talk about the clone wars in a, in a moment here. And that didn't have a Vader in it and that was phenomenal with all the directions that they went with the different vil villains and the different challenges that they had. So it's not Vader dependent even though Vader has some wonderful lines and took no prisoners and was really, really mean. So And awesome. For me, it was very Vader-centric, so we'll have to see. I don't know if it will be the same to me without Vader. So, I mean, there are other great lines, you know, Han and Chewie and Princess Leia were always awesome, but, and R2-D2, of course. As long as I guess there's R2-D2, it is too hard to uh, get upset, but I don't know. R2-D2 and Darth Vader, they're like the two sides of the Star Wars coin for me. And I agree. You know, it, it's the rise and fall of Vader that that is the 
the the the story and and Vader is the best character but um you know there there have been some good Siths in the books that have become phenomenal characters and and I, I think if the writing is good and if they really cast well um we can get a heck of a villain there all right. Well, speaking of villains, let's turn to the Clone Wars and General Krell and what happened in the fourth season. And I am not a Clone Wars person at all. So maybe, Judge, could you tell me a little bit about what actions Krell was taking as a general? It, it, it starts, it was, it was, it was a uh, four-episode arc and, uh, in the fourth season. And uh, it, it, it starts with Anakin uh, leading his battalion and uh, the 501 and, and um, a, a large takeover of a planet that's very important to the uh, Republic. And he is all of a sudden called away by the emperor, uh, coincidence or not. And, and General Krull steps in to lead his battalion. And, and that's where it, it starts. And right away you, you get the feel that General Krull has not the same kind of respect and admiration for the clones that General Skywalker had. General Skywalker led in the, in the front always. Uh, his troops loved him because there was nothing that he would ask of his troops that he wasn't willing to do himself. Uh, General Krull right away doesn't call any of the clones by their names. Uh, they're back to their clone serial numbers. And, and you can right away tell, you know, just the disconnect and the dislike for and the lack of respect for the clones. And that's where it really starts to take off. Oh, so the clones, I take it, did not react well to him then? Well, you know, the, the clones, uh, partly because of the way they were bred, uh, which is to follow Jedi and follow orders without question. Uh, you know, they, they, they are made to follow the general's orders. And, and, you know, for so right away, even though they didn't agree with some of the orders that he was taking and, and, and their commander um, did voice his opposition to a few of them, they followed through because that's what they were, they were bred, to, bred to do. Now, the, the commanders and the officers and the, the ARC troops, which are like their special forces, did have less programming with regards to following orders than the regular clone troopers because they needed them to be able to react more spontaneously, to be able to think more independently uh, because they were going to be tasked with tougher missions. So the, the, the same type of, of um, conditioning on them wasn't, wasn't uh, to the same level as the troopers, which is why a lot of those ARC troopers had to be gotten rid of or escaped actually when order 66 down the road came into play some of them actually went back to in the books which might not exist anymore uh <laughs> went back to mandaloria and and kind of started back up the the mandaloria uh planet which boba fett then comes back to lead later on in other books that might not take place anymore <laughs> This is a very cool expanded universe, though. And one of these days, I'm going to get into it. Maybe if I can get my kids back into Star Wars, I'll uh, be able to start reading and watching some of this stuff with them. Well, this supposedly, is Disney, Disney's trying to, you know, make Boba Fett, I'm hearing, into a bit more of a hero uh, for a movie. So that's going to be interesting to see how they pull that off as well. Oh, that is kind of, I like it. That's kind of a twist. Okay, well, let, let's back up. First off, <laughs> aren't into Star Wars? We're calling Child Protective Services because that's just wrong. Okay, they were. They got out of it. They're in other things now. I know. My son's obsessed with finding Bigfoot. What can I say? Yeah. Just tell him Bigfoot is really Chewbacca. <laughs> All right. So that's and issue. Get him right back in. Yeah. Okay. So that's issue one. Issue two: the fact that Anakin Skywalker slaughtered younglings, and we're still able to market him from Disney. I think we'll be okay working in a Boba Fett movie of the <laughs> bounty hunter who's redeeming himself. There, there's a bunch of ways that we could go, but after you slaughter children and a building full of them, there's really, I mean, that, that sets a pretty low bar of, you know, what, what's acceptable. So. <laughs> so what is Order 66? Order 66 is uh, the 
pre-programmed order in all of the clones' minds uh, that when that order comes about, you're to kill uh, any, Jedi, any Jedi that are in sight. Uh -huh. uh, and that's the way the overwhelming bulk of the Jedis were, were massacred on uh, the same day around the universe and, and putting the Jedi order out of existence. Oh, wow. Except for, except for the, the, the twins that escaped and, 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 and Obi-Wan and uh, a few splattering other Jedis here and there and, and, and Yoda and then Darth Vader uh, at that point you know, began his purge of the remaining Jedi's and traveled the universe to kill whatever Jedi's that were still around that were in hiding. So it's a good feel good moment. So <laughs> yeah. So, 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 so let's Sorry. Go, oh, go ahead, Josh. Sorry. So going back to, to Krell, in the first part of the story, you know, they they have a plan to attack a city and Skywalker's plan is to do multiple attacks at the same time, hit and run, soften the target. And on one level, it reminded me of President Garfield's Civil War strategy on how he became a war hero with breaking up his force and all attacking from this, at the same time from different directions. And the Confederates thought there was a large army attacking from all sides. So it kind of reminded me of that. Krell did something that would be truly barbaric and not trying to protect the lives of the troops, but taking the main road into the city for a frontal assault. And if history's taught us anything, frontal assaults generally don't end well for those conducting the frontal assault. So he's, he's putting his own men through a meat grinder, which is also not endearing his leadership style to the men because he's getting them slaughtered left and right. Especially when they have come up with alternative uh, ideas to take the same uh, ground with less man lost but and, and it all goes back to the fact that for him a clone is no more than a droid it, it's literally a a, a non-existing type of person it's, it's it's a person that's only sole purpose is to fight and to die for the republic and if they have to use ten thousand men to take the city it doesn't matter because they're just clones they're just they just have numbers they're not they're not real people. They don't have any thoughts. They don't have any desires. They don't have any um, and any dreams. They're they're just clones. Oh, that is so sad. Do they ever address their legal rights or like their identity as humans or anything? Is there ever any any reference to that in the Clone Wars? And, and they they do. The the commander and and you know his 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 officers do debate whether we should you know follow this general and and. It, it, what's great is there, there was basically all of the different viewpoints are represented by different clones. You had uh, one whose uh, designation was 5555, so his nickname was Fives. Uh, <laughs> the shouldn't be following any of these orders. This guy's a nutcase. We need to do what we need to do. And then you had one guy, Hardcore, who was, no, he's the general. We have to listen to exactly what he's telling us. End of story. And there were a couple that were in between that. So you, you did have that internal debate when the general wasn't around as to whether or not they should follow his order or not. And, and the, the, what was interesting is that the, the smarter clones and the more creative clones on each of these attacks was able to figure out a way covertly of getting the objective without losing all of the men. So they, they, they appeared to be following the general's orders for the most part, but when in reality, uh, they, they were um, saving themselves. Wow, well, that's smart. So there was never any mutiny against him or his orders? At the end. At, what happened at the, at the end? end? At, okay, Josh wants to rear us in. <laughs> There's a step before the end, after they capture the city, because they realize we have a enemy battleship in orbit that the separatists are, uni are using to, you know, bring in supplies that's going to cause us massive losses. We have some of their captured ships. Let's take the ships up there. To which the general says, no, don't fly those. So they say, okay. And they practice on their own, learn how they work on their own, and launch their own mission. So you have them outright violating orders 
for the greater good so they can actually achieve their higher orders because Krell's turned into such a whack job and doing things in the worst way humanly possible. So there are elements of, you know, there's a touch of cane mutiny in there. Uh, there's, there's some other, you know, examples as well from literature and, and books that come in, even from uh, the opening days of World War II, where you had the interim admiral before Nimitz took over uh, after Pearl Harbor uh, cancel a resupply mission. Um, so that did not end well. So it was, it was quite fascinating. It was quite fascinating because you had sailors talking, maybe we should go in and just go out and do it. And the Admiral leaving the bridge going, I can't be a part of this. So there was, there was a little of that. And even when this mission was successful and they came back, you did have a formal charging of court martial um, for the troops for disobeying orders, even though they successfully completed the mission better than the general would have. And, and, scheduling basically for a court-martial type of trial. And then the generals basically says, now nah, that's going to take too long. Let's just execute them. Uh, and, 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 and at that point, you know, a firing squad is created and the, uh, the mutineers are put on the wall and the clone troopers are at that point ordered to fire and kill their fellow clone troopers. Um, okay, and spoiler alert, everybody, if you haven't seen this, but I want to know, do they actually fire? They actually fire, and every single clone trooper would make the stormtrooper very, very proud because every shot missed. Aww. Good. So I assume that it was eventually revealed why Krell was being so wacko? It was eventually revealed, and, and throughout, you never really, you know, it, it, you know, it appeared that it was just this, dislike of the clones. Mm -hmm. it, it turned out to be much more than that. He was basically auditioning uh, to become Count Dooku's apprentice. He wanted to, uh, he had joined the dark side and, and at that point wanted to become a Sith himself. So he, he was doing this so by wiping out the clones and by failing to take this planet, he would then be able to go to Count Dooku and say, look what I did for you, make me your apprentice. Oh, wow. Interesting. So that kind of makes, I mean, and I'm not an expert on military law, and I know there have been, you know, I think about Vietnam, and I know there are cases on when you have to follow an order and when you don't and everything. But it's kind of interesting if, can you really judge the order that was violated in the vacuum, or do you have to take that later known fact that he was actually a traitor into consideration when deciding whether following the order was lawful or not, right? What, what's, what's always tough with, with, with military law, and you, you only have to follow a lawful order. But what is determined to be lawful or not in the moment is incredibly, incredibly tough. Right. But if you're willing to, to, to face a court-martial, that's what you're supposed to do. If, if you do not believe that the order is lawful, then you're obligated not to follow it or you could be brought up on, on war crimes. Uh, if, however, it's determined that the order was lawful, then you're subject to court-martial. So it's not a, an easy thing at all. Now, no. the reality of today's army is it travels with lawyers. And, and, and there are lawyers and JAG officers that are, that are connected with every command. Um, and, and the commanders seek legal opinions from their, their JAG Corps and their staff judge advocate as to whether or not this particular action is lawful or not. And, and if a JAG officer was to say this is not lawful, odds are that commander would be hard pressed to, to order that. Uh, otherwise he would be subject to a, a, a court martial. Wow, but yeah, otherwise he can use kind of a whole reliance and advice of counsel sort of defense to later, you know, defend, I guess, his position if it is said, no, that wasn't lawful. So, huh, interesting. I didn't realize it was that complex. Sounds like those poor clones could have used some legal help probably at several steps of the way. I, there, there was not in any episode, uh, any, any JAG component to uh, any of the, the clone uh, units, which uh, unfortunate. So may, may, maybe that's you know a, a uh, something that's needed in in the next movie. We should have some Jedi lawyers attached to the new uh, the new Jedi units to help them 
to uh, make these kind of decisions. Maybe Oscar Isaac can be a Jedi lawyer. What, so. Whatever can employ, we, this, we need, lawyers need jobs, especially in today's <laughs> economy. So what, whatever can help lawyers get jobs, I'm all for. Yeah, lots of extras instead of CGI, you know, if they need lawyers to be in stormtrooper outfits. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of stuff. That's right. We'll do all kinds of things. Well, this is very exciting. I am, I have to say, I'm looking forward to Star Wars 7. Um, you know, I have a few concerns. James Earl Jones' voice had better be somewhere in the movie. That's all I'm saying. And there better be more women. Um, maybe some more people of color, too, would be nice, JJ. You know, not all geeks are white men. So, uh, <laughs> So I'm hoping for that. So Obi-Wan, if you can pass that message on to JJ, I'd appreciate that. Josh, any final words? May the fourth be with you. <laughs> Judge, how about you? Thank you so much for joining us today. And as our resident Star Wars expert, do you have any final thoughts on the movie or the Clone Wars? I'm going to go with may the fourth be with you always as well. <laughs> Thanks, you guys, so much. Thanks, everyone out there. And yes, may the fourth be with you.